Why, hello, friends. It's a pleasure to see you again. Have you been well since the last time we were together? We do hope so. We care ever so much about each and every one of you. Bigs, talls, littles, smalls, we're glad that you can come here and join us and listen to our stories. Speaking of stories, how have we been enjoying the Forgotten Door, eh? Much goings-on in Chapter 10, wasn't there? Miss Josie joining them for lunch, Brooks and Sally letting on that they knew the threats against the beans, and, quite possibly, an upcoming visit from Miss Josie's acquaintance, Mr. Quinn. Who is he? Who is Colonel Quinn? What will he do? What does he want with Little John? Well, we're about to find out. For here is Chapter 11 of The Forgotten Door. And since we're at the end, we will also be presenting Chapter 12. So you get a two-for-one this time. But first, are you ready yet? Do you have your blankie or your stuffy or your pipe or your mug or your bowl or your beer or whatever it is? or whoever it is that makes you feel more comfortable? If not, go and get them. We'll be right here waiting for you. So, while they're off, how about the rest of you? Is everyone well? I hope so. Do drop a comment down below. It's been ever so dreadfully difficult to make this entire thing. <laughs> it's quite text me, you know. But it's all for you. <laughs> So I hope you realize that, and quite possibly that this will be cut out. Alas, i got to say it to you anyway. So, thank you. Have you got them yet? Excellent. All right, everyone, settle in. Put your best listening ears on as we read chapters 11 and 12 of The Forgotten Door. The Forgotten Door by Alexander Key Illustrated by Dom Lupo Chapter 11 He is in danger The next day started badly. They had planned to leave early for the cave, but when Thomas went out to the barn at dawn, he discovered that his one milk cow was missing. She had gone back into the pasture the night before, this morning, the pasture was empty, and the gate to the road at the far end of it was open. It was obvious that the cow had been stolen, and most certainly for spite. Little John knew that Thomas never expected to see her again. The road was jamming with cruising sightseers, and the young deputy, back on duty, was having trouble keeping a fresh batch of reporters out of the yard. The deputy had brought Mary a paper from town. There were pictures in it showing the bean place and the deputy standing in the lane. The story was captioned, Mystery Boy's Fame Spreads, House Guarded. In a separate column, a new question was asked, Is Mind Reader from Mars? Thomas glanced worriedly at the headlines and glanced at the passing cars through the unbroken window. Little John, watching him, was sick at heart. Who would have dreamed that his presence here could cause so much trouble? He was wondering what he could do to repay the beans when he saw Thomas stiffen. A long black car driven by an army chauffeur had turned into the lane past the protesting deputy. Two officers in uniform got out. That's Quinn, Thomas exclaimed. If he thinks he's going to see you, he's got another guest coming. Little John peered uneasily at the officers from the corner of the window. Colonel Eben Quinn was the tall, pale one. The colonel paid no attention to the guard. Official business, he snapped, without turning his head, and strode up to the house as if he owned the world. Thomas met him on the porch. Colonel Quinn was very pleasant at first. He shook hands with Thomas, introduced his aide, a Major Gruber, and said how delighted he was to see Captain Bean of the Marines again. It was all surface talk, little John knew, for the colonel was far from pleased with the thought of having to deal with someone like Thomas. My department, the colonel said finally, is much interested in John O'Connor. Aren't you going to invite us in to meet him? No, said Thomas. I am not. You're being very inhospitable, Captain Bean. Sorry, said Thomas. I'll have to remain inhospitable. You're not acting wisely, Captain. I understand the boy has lost his memory. 
We have some fine doctors in Washington. We'd like to help that boy. Thomas's voice hardened. Tell me another tale, Colonel. I know exactly what you want with him. You'll not have him. Colonel Quinn suddenly chilled. We'll see about that. Are you his guardian? I am, said Thomas. It was stretching a point, for Little John knew Miss Josie had not yet prepared the papers. I doubt it, the colonel snapped. I had a talk with Miss Groom before I came out. She's of the opinion that Judge Cunningham has been exceeding her authority in the case of John O'Connor. The whole matter is very curious, and we've been investigating it. The fact remains that no one knows where John O'Connor came from, and no one can claim him. But the government has a certain priority. The colonel paused. Little John was aware of Mary standing close. Now he felt her hand on his shoulder, tightening. Brooks and Sally had crept nearer, and Brooks was thinking, What right has that tall guy to come here and try to take John from us? Under the circumstances, said Colonel Quinn, I think you would be wise to consider our proposal. John O'Connor has a rare gift we can use. In return, we'll give him the best of homes and care. Anything he wishes, in fact. If the boy wants you and your family with him, I'm sure that can be arranged. No, said Thomas, turning away. You're wasting your time. Goodbye, gentlemen. Not so fast, Colonel Quinn said icily. If you persist in being stubborn, we'll very quickly find legal means to take the boy off your hands. Try it, and I'll fight you with every dollar I've got. John has some rights, and I intend to protect him. We'll see about that. In the meantime, I'll warn you not to let that boy out of your sight. There are others just as interested in him as we are. You were in intelligence. You know what they're like. If anything happens to him before we get back, we'll hold you responsible. Colonel Quinn spun on his heel and, followed by his aide, strode quickly out to his car. It was a very grim Thomas who re-entered the room. For long seconds, no one spoke. Then Brooks, wide-eyed and half-frightened, said, Good grief, Dad! Who'd have thought? I mean, what can we... Yes, said Mary. What can we do, Thomas? This is getting to be perfectly awful. I'd better phone Miss Josie, said Thomas. It was past noon. Thomas managed to get Miss Josie at her home. While Thomas talked, little John tried to think. Everything was so unbelievably tangled on this world, with their laws and their money and their hates and their fighting for power. He could see only one solution that might help the beans. Thomas hung up at last. He shook his head. Miss Josie's trying to work out something, but all this publicity and Quinn on top of it has stirred up a hornet's nest. Miss Groom is making trouble, and if the government steps in... But Thomas, Mary cried, they just can't take him away. I'm afraid they can, honey. If this were John's world and John's country, it would be an entirely different matter. And if Miss Josie had more time and could give us a chance to adopt John legally as our son, we'd have some rights. But there isn't time. Quinn wants John and Quinn's going to get him, unless I can hide him somewhere, and fast. No, said Little John. I've caused enough trouble, Mr. Bean. I think it would be better for everyone if I go with Colonel Quinn and do what he wants. Absolutely not! If Quinn gets his hands on you, you'll never see home again. We're going to that place we discovered. No one can find you there, and it's mighty important that you be there anyway. Mary, get us some blankets while I fill the knapsack. John, maybe you'd better change into your own clothes. We've nothing to compare with them for camping. There was no changing Thomas's mind. In a very short time, they were slipping out past the garden fence, carrying their equipment. Rascal trotted beside them. They edged around the barn, skirted the pasture, and reached the road a quarter of a mile beyond the house. They crouched in the brush until no cars were in sight, then hurried across. In the woods on the other side, they began angling up the slope toward the Gap Trail. They were still some distance from the Gap when little John stopped at a warning from Rascal. Mr. Bean, he whispered, we're being followed. Thomas froze. It must be reporters, he muttered. No, it's Mr. Pitts and some strangers, men I haven't met or seen around. I, I should have known about this earlier, but there were so many people on the road... His mind went out, searching, and his small hands clenched as he became aware of the danger they were in. Thomas, especially. They would kill Thomas to get John O'Connor. It shocked him to realize that men would place such terrible value on John O'Connor's abilities. 
He said quietly to Thomas, They've been watching the house with with field glasses, waiting until we left. They can't see us here, but they saw us cross the road. Mr. Pitts thinks we're headed for the gap. If we hurry, Thomas whispered, we can lose them on the other side. No, they've stopped, waiting for others to come. There are four, five in all. Mr. Pitts is talking to them. He's telling them we're bound to get away once we cross over. He's going back and getting a dog, that bloodhound you once had. If the others can't catch us, they'll wait for him at the gap. He, he thinks there's some sort of government men he's helping. Muscles knotted in Thomas's jaw. A fool like Gilby would swallow that. They've got us checked. We can't go to the cave. That bloodhound could trail us anywhere. There was nothing to do but circle back, then quickly, and as quietly as they could, return to the house. The sun had gone down over the ridge when they finally slipped in through the kitchen door. Mary paled when Thomas told her what had happened. You'd better call the sheriff, she urged. That young deputy has gone home for the night, and John's got to have some protection. This is an attempted kidnapping. Thomas made several calls, all without result. The sheriff was away from town, and there were no deputies immediately available. If I know Quinn, muttered Thomas, we'll soon have more protection than we want. He'll get a company of military police out here and sew us up tight. He was thinking of doing that when he left, little John told him. Thomas locked the doors and began limping about the room, snapping his fingers. Once he went back into the bedroom and came out with a pistol thrust into his pocket. Little John knew he hated weapons. Thomas had used too many in the past. Little John studied the road through the windows. The twilight was deepening. A knot of coldness gathered in him as he considered what might happen to the beans. So long as he was with them, Brooks and Sally and all of them would be in danger unless the military police came, and that probably wouldn't be until morning. Danger was out there. It wasn't close yet, but it would surely come upon them after dark. The road would be clear, and the one remaining car containing watching reporters would be gone. Already the unknown men with Gilby had discovered that he and Thomas had not taken the Gap Trail. He wished he could understand what they were planning, but they were scattered about, and there were more men gathering. So many thoughts were confusing. Thomas came over beside him. John, he said softly, not trying to show his growing worry. What's going on outside? Any idea? I'm trying to find out. It was hard to concentrate. Something was stirring in his mind. He tried to thrust it away, for at the moment it didn't matter. All that mattered was to draw danger away from the beans. As he studied the twilight again, he was aware of Rascal's uneasiness. Suddenly, he knew that Gilby Pitts was somewhere over on the edge of the pasture, in the shadows. Gilby had Angus Macklin with him, and some of their friends. They were going to help the outsiders as soon as dark came. What was their plan? He tried to reach Gilby's thoughts, but other thoughts kept intruding. There seemed to be a whispering in his mind. Little John, little John, where are you? All at once he gasped and stood rigid as understanding came. Mary, seeing him, cried, John, what's wrong? The door, it must be open, he managed to say. My people, they're here. They're calling me. Little John, where are you? Chapter 12, He Escapes. Can you hear them? Thomas exclaimed. In your mind, I mean? They've come for you? Yes, they've come... Through that place, it really is a sort of door. I can almost see it. It was broken on the other side, but they've got the power working and the door is open. It's a, a shimmering spot and you step right through it as if space were nothing. His hands were suddenly trembling. He clenched them and closed his eyes, listening to the silent voices calling eagerly to him. He answered and told them about the beans and what had happened. Stay where you are, he begged. There is danger here. The beans are in danger because of me. I must help them. He opened his eyes and looked at Thomas, and then at Mary. They are over on the side of the mountain, waiting for me. My father is with them, and my mother. Oh, John, I'm, I'm so happy for you. Mary's chin was suddenly trembling. There were tears in her eyes. Thomas said, in a voice that was not quite steady, John, can you... is it possible for you to make a break for it now and reach them safely? Little John bit his lip. Alone. He could do it easily. 
Yes, he said. But what about you? Don't worry about us, said Thomas. We'll be all right. But you wouldn't. Nothing here would ever be all right. If I disappeared, you couldn't explain what had happened to me. Colonel Quinn wouldn't believe you. Few people would. There'd be all kinds of trouble. Confound Quinn. I'll handle him somehow. But what of the others? Little John persisted. The ones out there. Could you make them believe it? Don't you see what would happen? Thomas turned pale. I didn't realize. Thomas knew now. Mary did too. Sally and Brooks would be in danger. They would surely be taken and held to be exchanged for John O'Connor. Life for the Beans would never be the same. There would be questions and trouble for years. Little John knew they had no near relatives and no one they could turn to. And time was getting short. It would soon be dark. They had only minutes to decide something. He looked at them, Thomas, Mary, Brooks, and small Sally with her frightened eyes and brave chin. He loved them all, and he didn't want to leave them. I don't remember what it's like where I came from, he told them, but I know it isn't like this. I'm sure, just from listening to what they're saying to me now, that we live in small groups and help one another. There are not too many of us, but we have great knowledge, and we've made life so simple that we don't have laws or even leaders, for they aren't needed any more than money is needed. I think we make things, everything with our hands, and that life is a great joy, for we have time for so much. They were staring at him, and Mary whispered, John, what, what are you trying to tell us? I, I'm trying to tell you that you'd like it there and that I want you to come with me. I've been talking to my people, explaining what's happened to us, and telling them I can't leave you. They, they've agreed that you must come with me. They gasped. He read their sudden confusion. How could they drop everything? They needed time to think, to plan. There's no time left, he hurried to say. You won't need anything from here, just flashlights to see your way through the woods. Suddenly, Sally said, Oh, John, I think it would be wonderful to live in a place where all the animals were friendly and nobody hunted them. Please, Daddy. Yes, said Mary. Thomas said, Okay, John, how do we manage to get away from the house? After I leave, wait a few minutes, he told them. When you hear shouts out in the pasture, get in the truck and drive as fast as you can up to the Gap Trail. Then climb to the Gap. I'll meet you up there. Before they could ask questions, he darted to the kitchen door unlocked it, and raced outside. He reached the enclosure in two bounds and released Rascal. Stay behind me, he ordered. Keep quiet. Where was Gilby now? His flying feet took him across the garden and over the pasture fence. As he touched the pasture, he heard a shrill whistle from the road and an answering whistle ahead. It was still twilight, and he had been seen already. It was better than he had hoped for. He slowed, pretending to be undecided. In the shadows ahead, he could make out Gilby and Angus and several others. He realized that their plan had been to set fire to the barn and draw attention from John O'Connor, who would be left unguarded. But John O'Connor was here, and he could see Angus, who carried an oil can, gaping at him in utter astonishment and disbelief, and sudden fear. There was a scattering of shoes over the stones along the edge of the pasture. Other men were coming in a rush. As he turned to dart away, a man called hoarsely, Head the boy off! Don't let him get past! Hit him with something, but watch out for that dog! A hurled stone went past his head. He leaped easily beyond the frightened Angus and saw a rascal spring growling at a second figure that tried to block his way. He listened for the sound of Thomas's truck. The way was clear, and the bean should be leaving. A rock grazed his shoulder, and another struck his back with such force that he stumbled and almost went sprawling. He gained his balance, but too late to avoid the next stone. There was an instant when he saw it coming, and abruptly there was the stunning impact of it across the top of his head. Consciousness did not leave him as he fell. He heard men shouting, the pounding of approaching footsteps, and a man's sudden scream as Rascal slashed into him. The big dog was all at once a whirling, snarling fury, his charges sending men tumbling as his fangs ripped cloth and flesh. Little John heard all this, but as his hands clenched the pasture grass, it seemed for a moment that he was somewhere else, far away on a hill at home. 
Memory flooded over him, and he saw again the valley people on the hill, and the glittering wonder of the shooting stars they had come to watch. Then he had fallen into the hill, into the crumbling chamber with its old machine. The machine spun a force that bridged space in an instant. You stepped through the shimmering door it made, and the threshold on the other side was somewhere else, another world. He struggled to his knees, aware of the fury that was rascal, of a man crawling away in pain. This wasn't home. This was the strange world, Thomas Bean's world. Only, there were too few in it like Thomas Bean, and the door to it had been long closed. He heard the sudden roar of Thomas's truck, and he sprang up with a glad cry. This was no longer Thomas Bean's world. The Beans were leaving. He began to run. Behind him, Rascal made one final charge and then raced to overtake him. There was pursuit, but his pursuers might as well have been following the wind. He and Rascal cleared the road together and went bounding upward through the darkening woods. He met the beans on the trail and led them on to where his people waited. They all carried glowing lights that made a radiance in the forest. But presently, one by one, the lights vanished. The forest grew still again, and empty, save for a wandering doe and her fawn. The Bean House stands empty. All through the mountains, people whisper of it and shake their heads. When the first investigators came, there was still food on the table untouched. Everything the Beans owned was there, and nothing had been taken, even from the shop. Thomas Bean's truck was found up the road abandoned. The Beans had simply vanished, empty-handed, without the least sign to indicate what had happened. And the strange boy, John O'Connor, had vanished with them, leaving an angry and baffled colonel who appeared the next morning and whose men searched the mountains for days. So the bean place stands empty, and the pasture and the fields are overgrown. Gilby Pitt never goes by there if he can help it. Angus Macklin has moved away. Miss Josie went there only once, just after the colonel left. She found three curious carvings on Thomas Bean's desk, which no one else had eyes for. She treasures them, and often wonders about them when she is alone, but she has never mentioned her thoughts to anyone. Across a threshold, and somewhere far beyond, there is a hill where the valley people often gather when the day's work is done. From it, you can watch the glittering night unfold and see the whole magic sweep when the shooting stars begin to stream like jewels across the sky. Even the deer come out to watch, unafraid. Well now, what did you think of that, the finale of The Forgotten Door? All's well that ends well, the beans escaped with Little John through the door to another world entirely. A world without fear, or money, or greed, or hatred, or even laws, or governments. It sounds almost impossible, doesn't it? But then when you think that, after all, we're all very much alike, everyone with the same hopes and dreams, wanting to be loved, respected, and remembered. We're not all that much different, either on the outside or the inside. And perhaps it would be best for all of us to remember that, and so, in the end, to help us all become one. We'd like to thank you for listening to The Forgotten Door with us. We'll be continuing novellas later on, but first... I'm afraid I have to get back to the little stories. So, tell your littles that there soon will be a new one coming up. The rest of you, thank you very much, and we ask that you click like, share, and subscribe below, and always remember that you are loved, that you are strong, and that you are not alone. I'm Percival. Thank you for watching.